Hey everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for August 22nd, 2012. I'm Matt Gradwell with Uppercut Woodworks. You can find me on the web at uppercutwoodworks.com and you can find me on Twitter at Uppercut Wood. You can find all of these Wood Chat videos on YouTube um, at uh, youtube.com slash user slash Uppercut Wood. They all have the transcripts, uh, Twitter transcripts embedded in the video right there in the uh, captions. Uh, with me tonight is my buddy Chris. Hey there, my name is Chris Wong. You can find me at flarewoodworks.com on Twitter, Flare Woodworks. And with us today we have a good friend of mine, Brian. Um, Mr. The Second Woodworker, Second Greatest Woodworker to, to Do a Tweet Alongs, if you ask me. <laughs> Where can um, we find you, Brian? Hi guys, Brian Van Vreedy here, uh, BC Craftmaster. You can find me uh, in all my builds at BVV Craftmaster on Twitter. Um, just trying to uh, tail along what Chris is doing with the tweet alongs. It's a lot of fun, and it kind of uh, it makes you it makes you think about what you're doing because if you don't do it well, you don't want to take a picture of it and show it on Twitter. So uh, it definitely helps out a lot. Mm -hmm. Cool. So the topic tonight, um, we have, we're going to have a couple topics, but um, the main topic tonight is going to be how to take your woodworking to the next level. Um, we had some things we wanted to talk about before that, though, right, Chris? Yes. Um, last month we had a lot of special guests on the show, and the last few we haven't had a special guest, and we'd like to know if there's someone in particular that you think would be a, a, someone you'd like to have on the show. So, so if you've Matt's got ideas making a about list of all these names. See, yeah. mm -hmm. So maybe I'll, maybe while you guys discuss that a little bit, I'll type some of the ideas we had uh, into the chat room to see what people think, and then they can maybe plus one or you know say yes to some of those ideas. So. All right. And then Chris, did you also want to talk to uh, talk about sculpting a little bit? Uh, we can get into that a little bit later, I think. Okay. So I'm going to type this stuff into the chat room while you guys. Okay, so where are we here? Dale's in the chat room. Dale's building his uh, whiskey cabinet. Um, he's been posting yes. about that on Facebook. I don't know if anyone else has seen that. Mm -hmm. Coming along. He just That's finished. Right. Yeah. 48 uh, dowels, right? Was it 48? Yeah, 28, yeah, 28 or 48. Yeah, one or the other. But he just, uh, I think he just finished the back panel, which looks really nice. Yeah. I think that's a great example of actually what we're talking about, how to take it to the next level. There was the one picture he was asking whether the back panel should be this way or upside down. or And that's it's those little choices that you make that can really elevate your design. You're talking about thinking about the grain direction? Yes, yes. Yeah. And that even, that even helps more than just the design aspect. It actually helps a lot with uh, finishing techniques and being able to, if you're going to book match boards or if you're going to put boards next to each other mm -hmm. and plan on planing them with a hand plane, you want to make sure that the grain is going in the same direction because if you hit the middle joint huh. with the hand plane, you'll end up getting a lot of tear out on yeah. one side and not on the other. Yeah. Um, that's one school of thought. I'm kind of the other way. I'd rather have it look good, and I'll, I'll deal with that bit of tear up. Okay. I'll attack it in a little bit different way to avoid that. Um, 28 dowels in Dale's cabinet. 28 dowels, that's a lot. Uh, cool. So I put, the, uh, I put some of the special guest ideas in the chat room, so we'll see what people say there. <laughs> yeah. Did Bill did Bill make it to the hangout here? I see I his picture stuck. here. And I think I think Bill is stuck. Okay. He's in the chat room though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Chris, how's the uh, the the bunk beds? Have you been working on the uh, the child's loft bed at all, or no? I, I got I got the flu last Monday, and I'm still recovering. Uh, really low on energy. Yeah. So shop time is shop time. Uh, those builds are third in line, right? You have two other jobs um, before that? Yeah. Well, my big job right now is to market this table. Okay. 
Uh, Chuck Bender. Yeah, he'd be a good one. He would be great, actually. And he was actually talking to us about it that one day. That's right, yeah. So, I'd like to get Scott on here, you know. Mr. Scott Neek. Yeah. Have you guys seen the, uh, the jointer plane that he's working on? Yeah. I mean, he, took, he took the picture and lined up his three other planes that he offers, and they still were not as long as this jointer plane that he made. Right, so right. when you lined them up end to end, they weren't as long as that? Correct. Oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, 36 inches, right? I think it was about that, yeah. I don't know if we can find a picture of that. Yeah. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill, you made one. it in. How you doing, man? Hi, guys. How's it going? Uh, so hey, far, I'm still playing with this a little bit. I'll okay. get it figured out in a sec. Look, I have my own special coffee cup. <laughs> Why we screw? Why we paint our coffee cups with nine hundred colors? I don't know. Oh, and what's this? Dale's building a. Oh, that's the that's the whiskey cabinet. Right. Okay. Yeah. That is beautiful, Dale. Okay, so um, to kind of start the discussion around taking your woodworking to the next level, I wrote down, I don't know, five or six ideas that I thought maybe we could uh, help kick off a discussion. Hopefully, people in the in the uh, in the room are, are listening, but I'll type these in there as well. So, one of the things that Chris and I talked about beforehand was uh, woodworking is one of those things where you need to get your reps in, and so um, and and you need to have a kind of a, a, a continuity of skill. Is the only way I know how to describe it. So, for example, the first uh, I, you know anybody can cut great hand cut dovetails. Very few people can cut great hand cut dovetails the first time they do it. But if you put the proper practice in um, and you do that practice um, day after day after day, you can quickly improve and, and, and quickly get much faster. So that's what I mean about, about getting your reps in. The other one is obviously there's things like classes and books and videos that you can take from simple things like woodcraft classes on the weekend to going out to Mark Adams School of Woodworking or Port Townsend School of Woodworking or William Eng School. Um, one resources that I, that I always forget that um, Steve Ramsey uses a lot is your local library has books and they all have videos and things like that. But a lot of that stuff is obviously free. I um, I'm a guy who traditionally avoided YouTube because a lot of the videos were a lot of the videos on YouTube were just dorky and a lot of the comments are full of offensive stuff and I kind of avoided it. But lately I found some great. Um, some great woodworkers on YouTube that I like to watch, and I've been subscribing to them. So if you see who I'm subscribing to, um, you'll see who I'm talking about. But one of my favorites lately is Deset and Wolf. I'll put the link in the chat room. Um, they build fantastic stuff, and they do a lot of handwork. Um, I think I've seen Duchette and Wolf. I think when I was I was actually looking for information on draw boring. Um, Table ends. They're one of the only YouTube videos out there, and it's like just music in the background. Yeah, there's no talking. It's not instructional. It's just yeah. watch them build. But very uh, nice stuff that they do there. Really, really great. Really yeah. great. And then I think the other thing um, that has is, is kind of been a topic in the past is um, if you want to take your woodworking to the next level, there's skills outside of woodworking you need, like design skills and sketching skills. And so sketching is a thing where you need maybe a little bit of training and also some repetitions and you don't have to worry about your sketches being photorealistic they can be in a computer or in a sketchbook I think a sketchbook's a great idea because you can carry it with you and use it whatever you want um, and then there was one one more um, last one for me which really worked for me which was take on a project that you're not sure you can do and yeah, yeah. force yourself to do it, um, even if it means that you might have to do things two or three times to get them right. Um, but if you never commit to doing something challenging, then you're just going to do the same thing over and over. And so make a commitment to, to do something that you've never done before that you might not even know how to do or have the tools to do, and just kind of dive in and, and commit yourself to doing it um, <laughs> and power through. So. So yeah, that's ideas. a great way to improve. Hey, there's Vic. Yeah, Vic's in the chat room. Um, Matt, I kind of wanted to comment on the first, uh, your first 
point that you made. Could you repeat that first point that you made? I don't know if you have it written you need, down. You need, or not. you need your reps. Your reps. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of. I started. I think I started to really, really take off with my commitment towards woodworking with uh, with with Mark and Matt and Shannon on Wood Talk Online. I think that's where it really started to be more than just something on the weekend. I started taking it with me to work every morning and listening it, listening to Wood, uh, Wood Talk Online every morning. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became I needed to go to the shop every morning. So I was waking up an hour early, and I spend about an hour in the shop every morning. Mm -hmm. Every night after work, my wife is nice, nice enough to let me spend 30, 45 minutes at the shop. So just being able to be there every day mm -hmm. and slowly but surely in, like improve on something better than the next day every day. Mm -hmm. And it, it really makes a difference. I think I've been at this pace now for about close to a year now, and it's made a huge difference in everything that I've done in the shop. That's cool. That's cool. Um, one of the things I remember from it was either a Wood Talk online or a, a different discussion with Mark where it was basically you should at least go into your shop every day. And even if you can't do woodworking, just find 10 things to put away. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, I, I need to do. That. <laughs> I need to get better yeah. at that. I like what Vic just, I don't know if you guys saw Vic's comment there in the uh, chat room. Great way to get good is to only do your own designs. Figure out the joinery and go for it. I think that's a great point. Um, I'm not huge on working off other designs, but I, I don't mind it. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, my brother just mm -hmm. built Norm Abrams' router table. Yeah. Love it. I, I love this thing. And I, I don't think we could have come up with a better design not having worked with a router table as much as Norm Abrams has, you know? So I, I like Vic's point there. I, I think one of the things that's pretty cool about the whole um, situation is you learn more when you study somebody else's plans and then apply it to whatever it is that you're trying to do. So, you know, it's like getting in the reps. You know, sometimes you have to build something that somebody else tried. Oh, yeah. yeah, you can definitely do a lot of studying and learn that way too. Yeah. Have you guys taken a lot of classes or no? Or are you all self-taught completely? Um, I've, I've never taken a class at home, but I've taken a lot of training um, at Woodworking in America. I've done those, those, and I've even done the thing where you stay, stay after, skip the next class, and do the hands-on. Um, oh, actually... Well, I did some stuff, but I don't think it would really count as a class with um, attending a seminar that Daryl Peart gave. Um, but a lot, a lot of it's self-taught, right? A lot of it was um, my grandfather teaching me things when I was little. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if he saw my handsaw at WIA a couple years ago or last year, he'd <laughs> slap me. <laughs> yeah, I'm largely self-taught. Um, I did wood, the woodworking classes in high school, and um, those were mostly just access to the equipment, and I learned from there. Mm -hmm. um, on this on the screen now, you should see uh, Scott Meeks joint her plane with <laughs> a few other planes that are absolutely dwarfed by it. That's that's a monster. That's I'll, uh, I'll try and pull that up in the screen share here. I think I've got a screen share. Oh. oh, I've only got a little picture of it anyway. So, oh, click on click on the picture. It should bring it up. Scott, I did. All I got was a beast. little tiny. Oh, okay. All I got was a little. Let's see if I got a different. Uh, yeah, I think I've only got a small picture. So, if somebody's got a Scott, if you've got a bigger picture. Please share it, but I've only got a small picture, so. Do you not see it in, in my screen share, Matt? No, I All see, I see is a frozen picture of Chris when oh, when okay. it goes up on Chris. So yeah, mine's not my, my not working on my end. Okay, let me try that. Bill, have you taken any classes? Oh, there it is. There it is, right there. I'll make sure it's okay. in. Sorry, Bill. Wow. Right. No, that's cool. That <laughs> is a. That's All a right, big thing. Come in here and tell us about this thing. <laughs> 
I'm gonna we invite want details. You. Yeah, we want details on the. Uh, do you have a payment plan on that thing? <laughs> <laughs> to get one built, do I have to send you a full tree? <laughs> Bill, have you taken any classes before? I I just uh, really started. Um, to focus on that. I, I took some pen turning classes and things like that when I first got started. Um, but since I do a lot of CNC stuff, um, mm -hmm. most of my information is either coming offline uh, or um, through um, users group meetings. So okay. there's typically not a whole lot yeah. of training for that. You're, I think you're a great example, Bill, of how, you, how a lot of woodworkers are learning these days. They're not doing the formal education. They're just taking a bit from this over here and from this person over here and they're compiling it together into something that makes sense for them. Yeah, I you know, I admire the things that you guys do. I mean, it's really amazing to see, you know, Chris you turning out those amazing uh pieces of unique furniture and and, and everything. I have to look at those those projects and say, what can I take from that? What can I learn? What can I apply to my projects as well? Cuz it's it's mm -hmm. It's really impressive. Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot you can learn from other people. The first class I took was a, a chisel class. I've taken all my classes at the uh, Philadelphia Furniture Workshop mm. and taught by Alan Turner and Mario Rodriguez, who were both, they were both, they were right. two times ago, Alan Turner was on the cover of Fine Woodworking for his crosscut sled. And the last issue of Fine Woodworking was uh, all about block planes, and that was written by Mario Rodriguez. So they both know what they're talking about. Um, but I, I took a class on chisels to start, and I, I had a beat-up pair of marbles, and they weren't anything near sharp. Um, mm -hmm. My second class I took there was a sharpening class, which was, <laughs> which was huge. I mean... I would highly recommend people take a sharpening class before anything else because if you're trying to work with any sort of hand tools and you don't know how to sharpen them, you're going to hate them. They're horrible if they're not sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Chris, uh, I really like what Scott just said in the chat room. Uh, about teaching and learning it. from? The teaching, the teaching yeah. comment? Yeah. Um, where is it? Scott said, "I've learned more more by teaching than from anything else that I've done, and that 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 is very true." Uh, the same, I think I might say the same thing about, about writing because when whenever you're teaching or writing, you're expressing what you know or what you think you know, and you have to examine what it is, yeah. and you have to really think about whether it makes sense and whether you are doing it in a good way because you're influencing a lot of other people when you teach them. Yeah. It's a it's it's interesting because we have a we have, there's a concept in um, well it's it's probably broader than software development but we use it a lot in software development where when people have a problem we tell them to um, explain it to the dog okay <clears throat> because if you're gonna if you have a problem and you need to think about it critically enough to explain it to somebody you're likely going to talk yourself, you're likely going to get enough clarity of thought where as you're explaining it or doing the thinking about how you would explain it, uh, the solution comes to you, right? Because um, you, you have to really, really understand the problem. Well, it might be, this, might be the same kind of phenomenon with woodworking where if you're going to teach somebody to sharpen and using Brian's example, um, you have to kind of anticipate what questions you're going to get um, or how you're going to explain different angles, or why you would skew, or closing the—you know—you're going to have to explain all these different things, and so you have to really, really understand them. You can't just say, "I was taught to sharpen this way a hundred years ago. I know that it works. I don't understand it, and now I'm going to teach it to you." Right? Um, Unless you're Frank Close, you can do that. Yeah. Then you just say, "This is the way we do it." We're done. <laughs> yeah. There's a quote I've got on my website from Frank, and the quote is, I use a pencil. And that was in response to someone asking him why he uses a pencil. Yeah, and he just goes, I use a pencil. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if it works for you, hey, it's, can't, <laughs> you can't knock him for that. No, he just... Um, yeah, he's, I have some really good videos of him. He's just... He, he's great. He's great. And I have a good... There's that video of him where... Um, I think it's with Chuck Bender. He does a dovetail concept, contest, and Chuck looks at him and goes, Frank, you suck. Because Frank just <laughs> totally kicked his butt time-wise. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And his dovetails just fit together, just boop. And Chuck just goes, Frank, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> the Hanto Olympics might be in Pasadena now, right? Where did you hear that? Oh, did I, did I say something I'm not supposed to say? Um, there has been talk about uh, trying to organize something, someone to get it started. Um, I haven't heard any more details, but last I heard, there was an effort to get it happening. Won't be by the same people, though. Gotcha. I, I would love to see more joinery um, courses out there. Um, you don't see quite as many of those as, as I would like to see. Um, even at the at the big wood shows. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, every time I get my woodcraft flyer or my rockler flyer, I look at to see if they're going to have any interesting classes. Sometimes they have um, Rob Cosman come out, but a lot of the classes are um, not about the work you're trying to do. They're about the tool that they want you to use. Right, mm -hmm. so it'll be router one hundred and one, or bandsaw one hundred and one, or table saw one hundred and one. But I want to, I want, I, there. I think it'd be better to have a class that was joinery, and you might have to use three or four tools to do it. But the class is really focused on the joints, not on the tool they're trying to sell you. Separate than a class on just hand cut dovetails, correct? You're not talking about dovetails, right, Bill? You're talking like mortise and tenon or half yeah, lap joinery. Exactly. Yeah, show me five joints. Yeah. Right? And and if I need three tools to do it, that's fine. Or if there's alternate ways of doing each one, that's fine. But Yeah, sh like show the mortise and tenon with a drill press. Show it with a router. Show it with a hollow right. mortise and chisel. I mean, show it by hand. Yeah, bandsaw yeah. and a hand drill. Yeah. That's, that's funny you mention that because I've been working with Lee Valley to produce some seminars like that. And I think that we've actually even got them in the fall seminar. It's our fall session coming up. Excellent. That's it's kind of like how, uh, how Mark teaches over at the Wood Whisperer. He, kinda, he doesn't just show one yeah. way and say this is the best way. He shows a couple of different ways and say you decide which way yeah. is best for you in your shop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, with, with the joinery, um, you know, I, again, I do a lot of stuff with CNC router. Because you know I built the thing, so I get to use it a lot. But um, we come up with different ways of doing old old style joints using you know the router. And nobody really teaches that. Um, you know, it's just you try it for a different project, and if it works great, uh, you know you save the uh, the program. But there comes a time when you need to take hand tools to finish the joinery yes. and and things. You know, and you. If you don't know how to sharpen your chisels and you know other things, you're just gonna be lost. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I, I think that's another point of taking your woodworking to the next level is when you're able to combine both power tools and hand tools to not just try and get the joint correct on the first shot off the table saw or off the router, but going back and forth a couple times using a uh, a shooting board or going back and paring away a little bit with a chisel and just keep testing it. It takes a lot more time, but the joint, I mean, it's, it's, you don't have to go back to it or look at it later on in the project and be like, ah, oh, mm -hmm. I wish I would have done something about that. Yeah. I think that the mix of hand tools and power tools, what it really does for me is it, it's, it makes things efficient and it allows me to do things that I can't do otherwise. There's a lot of stuff I do that especially with the curves, that is really impractical. It would be so time-consuming to build a jig for a power tool. And knowing how to do it by hand it makes it so much easier, quicker, and I can get as good, a re as good of a result. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there are definitely things that you can only do by hand. Mm -hmm. Have you given any, any thought, Bill, to that table challenge I posed a while ago? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> What's yeah. the table challenge for people who uh, are in the know? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to find a picture. Um, last Christmas I built a sculpted ash table with a curved beam and a, a funky tabletop, and I challenged Bill to build it uh, with his by CNC. Ah, <laughs> I think Chris even said he would send it in the wood, too. Yes, I did say yeah, that. Yeah, I did. Uh, that was before fact, I thought he was in New York, but I still <laughs> might do it. Part, part of the problem was I was looking at his uh, twisted table at the time, yes. not this yeah. this one. So, yeah. you know, I was all over that twisted table. I thought I could pull off part of that. Uh, yeah. Yours is more of a challenge. I think I could do it, but it wouldn't be as... There, there's a point where machining and art separate. Yeah. And yours definitely would have the, the art to it. Yeah. Uh, um, I just finished reading Wharton Eshrick's book. Um, it's the, the Journey of a Creative Mind, I believe it's called. And one of, the, one of the quotes there was something along the lines of every year he'd have someone, um, some manufacturer approach him looking for a design that they could mass produce. And there just wasn't any because of the sculptural, sculptural element in his furniture. It just was impractical to, to make uh, by machine. Mm -hmm. Here's the table that I'm talking about on the screen here. Yeah, the, just analyzing it from a from a machining standpoint, the <laughs> the top table you could do very easily. The pedestal foot you could do very easily. What is yeah. difficult is the compound curves. Of yeah. The um, is that the riser? I'm not sure what you would call it. The leg uh, of the table. Yeah, um, uh, call it that's where it gets real dicey. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me kind of an axe handle. Yeah. Um, I guess that'd be a three-axis lathe that you'd use. I don't. I don't know how. I don't. I'm not, uh, realistically, I'm not sure how you do that. At least a four-axis. Four-axis. Yeah. What's the? It's the fourth-axis rotation. Yes. You'd okay. suspend. You'd suspend a long piece between centers, just like you would um, on a lathe, and um, the router would machine in three axes oh, around okay. it as it rotated. Are you talking about making this out of one piece or three separate pieces and putting it together still? Three separate pieces. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, four pieces would be interesting, huh? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I've already got too much of a challenge here. <laughs> yeah. That was a really fun piece to build. That was actually a quick build. I think it took me uh, one day or two days to make. And I wouldn't mind making another table like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I may. I don't know. My ego may not, might not let me back down from that one, but uh, uh, my brains are telling me that you, I should. <laughs> yeah. Was the, was the I'm gonna up a, sorry, I'm going to put up a poll on the site um, with a list of uh, people's names that so that wood chatters can vote on who they'd like to see as a special guest. Sure, and if you can fill in, put in a box or something saying, "Add your own, add another name to it." Yep, that's easy. Okay. Got to go catch up in the chat room here. Yeah, I've been uh, like I said, I was going to kind of. Be in the shadows today, monitoring the chat room. Yeah, yes. How's that happening? How's that working? It's. Yeah. I'm trying. I had coffee, so it's. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Chris, so, was, was there a certain point when you thought that you're like, you knew you were getting really good? I'm not sure exactly how you, how long you've been doing this for, but was it something like? You did a project, and you're like, I'm really getting the hang of this. Um, that was, it happened, it happens a lot, actually. <laughs> I, I always find, I often find a way that I, to elevate my work to the next level, and I think, wow, this is, it's really starting to come together, but then 
as I progress, I start to see where I can improve as well. Yeah. So I, I think it happens in every project for me. I, I, I find one thing that I've, I've done that I didn't know I could do before, and I also find something that I need to do to take my, take my woodworking to the next level. Um, I guess I've been woodworking for 13 years now. Okay. I, I think... think that, um, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. I think that, Brian, this is your, your first time sculpting, I think I read. Yeah, this is the first, this is the first time uh, dealing with anything curved. Right. On. So in, in this project, you've incorporated some curves along the top, the top rail, and you've uh, sculpted the armrest, right? Yeah, the... The back legs are actually, um, they curve in three dimensions. So they curve out, they curve back on the top and bottom. Um, the armrests are sculpted. Uh, the stretchers are curved, and that's actually a compound joint into the, into the back legs because the back legs curve out if you're looking at the bench from straight on, and the stretcher curves into it, down into it. So it's... That was complete, uh, completely hand fit into there. It was about three wow. hours to fit that in there. Yeah, it definitely a takes bit, a lot of time. Can uh, you make um, I'm power? going up the. There we go. Got the full size image here coming. Wow! Check your quick. internet service up there in Port Moody. <laughs> Carrier yeah, yeah, I have to. <laughs> I have to turn the pedals a little bit faster. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Let me go back. That's a little bit too big. I've got some issues with the family uploading stuff, I think. It's beautiful figuring on that wood. Yeah, it's a heavy yeah, piece of wood song. And I'm actually starting to, like, the, uh, the armrests and the back top stretcher are from different, it's from a different piece of wood, and we're planning on fuming this with ammonia, and I'm a little worried that the uh -huh. tannin level is going to be different and that they might fume completely different. Mm -hmm. What will the fuming do? I'm not familiar with that technique. Um, it's where you make like a plastic tent or you use like a big enough cardboard box and you put a plate of ammonia. Not mm -hmm. household ammonia. Household ammonia is 5%. Normally, I think it's like a... It's a... Uh, it's a stickly thing. And mm -hmm. you would use aqueous ammonia, which is like 28%. And I think they use that a lot for blueprints and print shops, and it's really caustic. It's really bad for your health. So I've read that you can use janitorial ammonia, which is like 15%. So I think that's the direction I'm going to go. But if you fume it, if you leave it in the tent exposed to that ammonia, not touching it or anything, just the gases uh, come in contact, and the, they mess with the tannins of the yolk, and it darkens the wood. And after you pull samples out after like two hours, six hours, seven hours, and it gets darker each time. And that's basically what it does. It penetrates like a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch deep. Hmm. It's going to be beautiful. Have you done uh, fuming before? No. A, a lot of the things that I do, I've never done before just because I really like the challenge of just doing new things. And if it doesn't come out well, most of these projects are for family still. So I can, mm -hmm. I can look at them and say, you know, that's where I was at that point in my woodworking career. It doesn't have to be perfect. I've only been doing this for a couple of years now. So I'm not, I'm not worried if it doesn't look like it should be in fine woodworking or popular woodworking. So Yeah, every, every project is a learning experience, right? Exactly. So you'll find a lot of times I'm saying this is the first time I've done this. Mm -hmm. um, Vic wants to know where you get your ammonia from. Um, I'm st I still haven't found it yet, but I think I know where I'm going to get it. There's this place called Donjon, D-O-N-J-O-N, -O and they're all janitorial. I mean, it's everything they have is industrial grade. So I think that's where I'm going to find the, the ammonia. Because I've read that it's like it's like ten dollars for a gallon, but shipping is like thirty nine dollars. Yeah, so. it's um. If you ever see a box that's coming to you from a shipper that says ORMD, it's other or yeah, other regulated materials, and there's some of the stuff that they can't fly, and they have, so 
the shipping for that's really really bad. Yeah. You get a box that says ORM on it. That's that's the problem. Scott says I'm on a watch list if I buy ammonia. Yeah, yeah. I wonder which kind of if you, if janitorial ammonia is okay or if it's <laughs> aqueous ammonia. Hmm. Uh, you know, we'll let you find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I read. I read about seeming. I'd never done it before. I've also read that you can get the same effect um, more safely using a dye. Yeah. Have I've you read considered that using a dye? We have, but I think we're we're pretty. I think we're pretty set on trying this. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that it's not going to blotch, there's not going to be any runs. I mean, it, it is what it is kind of thing. I, I like that. We've done black oak before, which is where you take, um, like, rusty nails and vinegar. Yeah. And we've done that. came out awesome. So mm. I think we're, we're, we're ready for another uh, science experiment in the shop. Mm. Yeah. The guys in, on, in the chat room are saying how... How hazardous ammonia is! You do, you do have to take precautions. Yeah, um, a lot of precautions, and be very careful handling it. Get some f good filters for. We have 3M, uh, like the big respirators, mm -hmm. but I think we need to get more than just the filters we have now. We need to get some some other filters. Yeah, the 3M masks have different um, cartridges you can put on, and the different cartridges are meant for different things. Mm -hmm. so I would I would definitely make sure that you have the right cartridges on. I would also think about eye protection and um, you know other skin protection, and then I would also think about yes, just gloves. open windows, man. Yeah, just you know, yeah. just do it outside, maybe. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can get the MSDS for for the ammonia and uh, for other things, and that'll give you some uh, indication. And also, um, law enforcement agencies have um, material safety hand handling books for hazmat. They could help you. Um, tell what's required for dealing with a specific uh, chemical. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Lugi in the chat room asked uh, if I was going to disassemble prior to fuming. That would sure help make it more compact for fuming. Um, I was actually on Twitter last night talking to uh, Matt Keeney and Greg Paoli about this. We have raised panels and we're draw boring all the mortise and tenon joinery. So uh -huh. we're trying to decide if the pluses and minuses of it. If we draw bore everything and bring everything flush, sand it down, plane all the, the Wenge dowels, that means that the raised panels are stuck in there when we fume it. So there's a risk of the ammonia not back. Yeah, and if the wood if there's any wood movement yeah. you might get, yeah. you might get uh, lines, right? Sight lines? Yeah. But if we fume everything separate and then put it together, yeah. after we draw bore it and oh, sand right. down the pegs and chisel down the pegs, mm. we risk marring the wood and maybe sanding through the fuming. Mm. Now, if you fume the panels and then seal them, will that protect them from further darkening when you fume the whole piece? That My brother was actually said that tonight, that we should maybe do the panels separately and then put it all together, seal the panels completely with whatever we're using, yeah. and then fume it all at once. I think that would actually work. Yeah. Yeah, time for test pieces. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you going to tent the whole piece in plastic and then use a pan of ammonia? Is that your plan? Yeah, yeah. It's... it's I might be able to get a large enough cardboard box for my work too, and if I can get that, I'll probably use a cardboard box. And will will that hold the fumes, or you need to pla plastic over top of it, or? I think you need to make some sort of base. I mean, I've seen there's two good articles on fine woodworking, um, and they kind of made it seem like it wasn't. I, mean, I know everyone's kind of all about hazmat and everything, but the articles say it's dangerous, but they kind of make it seem like it's no big deal. Um, mm. The one guy says, oh, I just put my dust mask back on or my respirator back on every time I reach in. But it's not, I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, it's I'm, not something I would fart around with. Yeah, I know. I'm going to take caution, but it doesn't, they, I don't think they, I don't know. I don't want to say they weren't being safe about it, but they made it seem like it's 
everyone can try it in their shop. And so I th I think that I think that if you were to pre-fume and then assemble and then you were to have spots that you needed to touch up and you refumed, I don't think the spots that were dark are going to get much darker. Do you know what I mean? Like, like they hit fuming is, a, fuming is a chemical reaction, and at some point, it's going to be done. Okay. Right. You, you, um, and so, I would do I would do a test piece where you um, fume an entire board, um, maybe on one half, make some sand marks or plane marks or whatever, and refume it and see what happens. But yeah, um, it's not like you're applying another coat. Of, of, of stain or dye, there the tannins react with the with the ammonia. Um, there's a chemical reaction. As soon as the tannins have, re and obviously if you only fume it a little bit and the reaction's not complete, you can obviously get it to get the reaction to continue. But if it's fully fumed, mm -hmm. it's kind of done. Yeah, because the ammonia and the tannins. Are, are are done and it's and it's not gonna it's not like the ammonia is gonna sink in deeper and make the surface darker, right? And so then I think if you were to um, have a spot where you expose fresh wood with fresh tannins and fume it, I think I think you'd be fine as long as you left Catch it in it long up. enough. Yeah, because yeah. I think we are we're we're trying to take it pretty dark. So if we do have to hit up another spot, I think we'd be able to do it. Yeah. So. I, I think that if you're gonna, especially if you're gonna go very dark, I think you're good to go. So, um, Bill, I have a special treat for you. Uh -huh. um, uh, you'll love this. So, one of the ways um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, well, I don't know if it's gonna elevate my woodworking, but it's definitely gonna help me. Last year, I did these awards for some Boy Scouts. It was kind of a charity project I did where it was a plaque for their arrows, and I laser engraved in a design. Mm -hmm. And I had, a, I had to find basically a maker space that had a laser engraver um, to do the laser engraving. And even though they gave me a good deal, it was still, it was still something like uh, $14 per award, and there was like 20 of these things. And so basically I made no money on the, on the Boy Scouts deal. Well, I found out that um, my work um, here, at, here, at, here at Microsoft, we have an 80-watt laser. Oh, sweet. Uh -huh. And employees can use it for free. No kidding. Um, I need to work for Microsoft. Yeah, there's a whole, we have, <laughs> actually, there's, a, there's an entire shop. We have 3D printers and drill presses and, wow. and things like that. And as long as you get trained on the laser, which I just got trained on it last week, wow. I can use it, and it's open 24 hours a day. Wow. Um, it's just a card key system to get in, so... Um, so I think about incorporating, uh, you know, the primary thing I think I'm going to do is do some engraving and then also do some uh, router templates. Beautiful. So, um, but there was one cool thing I saw at the Create Space um, using five millimeter plywood. A guy made a notepad by essentially um, taking a long piece of plywood like this, and in the middle here. He cut a series of offset curves, so he never went fully through, and mm -hmm. it made the plywood flexible. Right. Right. So he could close the. It was very, very cool. Very cool. So, um, so we'll see. I might do, um, you know, like a, a kickstand for a phone or a kickstand for a tablet, but primarily, I think I'm going to use it for laser engraving and. Um, Router templates, which can give you some really good router templates, really good way to make router templates. So yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of people who do um, laser cut router uh, templates. Um, sometimes they'll do them out of um, uh, like uh, hardboard or um, you know a good birch ply. Uh, I've also seen them done out of acrylic. Uh, yeah, you gotta cut, be, they can cut acrylic too. Yeah, you you've got to have uh, some way of getting the fumes out, and if they've already, it sounds like they already have. Well, so because it's Microsoft and there's OSHA and there's all these different regulations, they have a very good um, a very good system for handling the fumes. It's it's in a building where people have offices, so they they can't deal with any of that. So they have a real industrial system for you know filtering and exhausting and stuff like that. 
Yeah, it's funny. I did a uh, project for the Boy Scouts um, about two years ago. Um, I did a uh, Boy Scout um, logo for them. You know, the the emblem with the uh, the fleur de lis and the yeah. eagle. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think there was a picture of it on my blog uh, maybe a week or so ago. Uh, yeah, it's a good organization. It's a good um, good thing to do. Yeah. So I look forward to. Uh, I have a buddy in my coming over once a week. He's making a Telecaster electric guitar. And you can download the CAD file online. Uh -huh. He printed it out and taped all the pieces of paper together and then handmade a router temp template. And I said, oh, I wish you hadn't have done that. I could just send the DXF to the laser and we'd be done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The perfect router template. But um, That's funny. I'm working on a Stratocaster. Oh, right on. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I found out that the body is made of uh, ash after I bought the maple. The maple is really heavy. Uh, yeah. Maple really heavy. So um, I, I may do something that laminates the, the two and just, you know, call it a day. Yeah. Um, to, you know, have a nice figured maple on the top. And, yeah. <laughs> so that's what Stratocasters normally are. It's ash in the middle with maple veneers. That's what you're saying? They're usually fully ash on the body, and the, okay. the, the necks are uh, hard maple. Yeah. And the Telecasters are usually uh, ash, and they're painted with, um, it's called white, uh, blonde, golden blonde, blonde, white blonde, gold blonde, I don't know. And I'm thinking about using like a uh, Target Coatings water-based tinted lacquer for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um... And, uh, we're just spouting off projects. Um, last time I was on, I uh, showed some design work I was working on for a, a sign for uh, a neighbor who has uh, registered Holsteins. Mm -hmm. And um, I, this will be the first time uh, anybody's seen the finished product. So, oh, cool. Um, let me see if I can screen share that. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so, CAD, right? Or sorry, CNC. Yeah, that's um, CNC, and there's some handwriting around the uh, the roundover bits, etc., on the uh, the edges of it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's not just a photo V carve; it's also got some traditional V carving in it. Cool. So it, it's it's really very three dimensional when you see it far away. Yeah. It looks really good. How how deep does it go? What's the deepest that it carves into there? Only a quarter inch. Cool. Yeah, most of most of the um, uh, the shadow areas that you see on it um, are only about um, three thousandths thick. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of fun. That's very cool. Okay, guys, we're at about seven o'clock. So should we wrap up? Yeah, um, I, I, had, I had a suggestion for next time we do a, like a design jam or someone wants okay. to 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 showcase something they built that's maybe not in the G Plus Hangout but that's on Twitter. Would they be able to maybe submit something to you earlier on so that we could put it up on the live? Good feed idea, yeah. Right so pe people who don't have um, the Hangout but want to show something off, um, they can either share out an album on Flickr. Or uh, share the photos with the wood chat, um, wood chat on G plus, and then we can show the I can show the photos in the hangout, um, and they can take people through the take people through the um, the project uh, on tweet chat, and we can talk about that. But yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I like the idea. So well, that, what do you guys think? Is that the topic for next week? Somebody a design jam, and we'll put out the we'll put out the call for people to get their projects uh, ready to show off. Yeah. Sounds good. Oh, is your bench going to be done, Brian? Is, <laughs> is that why you're suggesting it? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I, it like, I always good. like it when people look to the ceiling to see if there's an answer. Yeah. yeah. Is it going to be done? <laughs> I should ask my wife, how much time do I get in the shop this weekend? Uh, ask, know. ask, you tell. You no. tell. <laughs> Don't do it, bro. <laughs> Don't do it, man. No. Don't take advice from me. <laughs> okay, cool. So you heard it. The topic for next week is a design jam for everybody. 
Um, if you don't want to join the Hangout, um, go ahead and get your pit photos together on your favorite photo sharing service. Uh, post that link to uh, share that link with WooChat on, on um, Google Plus, or, or just, just uh, tweet it with the hashtag. Twitter. Yeah, and uh, we can start the conversation about your project immediately. We don't have to wait until next week. Um, and uh, that should be it. Um, uh, I'm going to post a poll. I'll send a link to the poll about um, who you would want as your next set of special guests. Um, I'm going to suggest that we have some special guests related to Woodworking America around the time that Woodworking America happens, um, which for Chris and I is the middle of October in Pasadena. Um, so look for that poll. Make sure you go answer the poll. Um, if you have ideas or safety tips uh, for Brian with his ammonia fuming to keep him healthy, Please share those. We want to make sure everybody <laughs> lives a long, healthy life and gets lots of shop time. Um, so that'd be great. So we're signing off, everybody. Have a good, have a good week. Good night, everyone. Right, have a good night. Yeah.